Ooh, bitmap images. Here's a picture of an alien, and I've zoomed in on his eye, and you can see his eyes made up of these little coloured squares. Those little coloured squares are called pixels, and the term pixel is short for picture element. So it's literally the smallest part of the picture that you can identify. I want to try and draw a, a picture using pixels over here. So uh, I'll choose a colour and um, wish me luck. I'm going to just colour in some of these pixels here to create what I hope will look vaguely like a little face. So it's a little bit like that. Okay, If you squint and kind of look sideways at it, it looks like a little face. And because I've used two colours, only white and red, I can encode this with with binary digits. Okay, and if I encode it, I get this kind of a pattern. You can see the image in there. Actually, this is this is called a bitmap. So I'll just call that a bitmap, which is over there. So bitmap, and the bitmap tells you how that bitmap image would be stored in the computer. However, what it doesn't tell you, well, it doesn't store it in this grids form anyway. It'll store it all in one sort of straight line or, or whatever, in one memory, contiguous memory locations. And what it also won't tell you is what the ones and the zeros actually mean. There's, there's no way that the computer would know that the one was red and the zero was, was, uh, was white. So you need to send more information along with the actual bitmap itself in order to allow who the, the computer that's rendering that image to be able to display it. So three so three main pieces of information you need to send along with it. First of all, the pixel dimensions. You will hear this referred to as resolution as well, the pixel dimensions. Uh, I tend, well, I, I always call it pixel dimension rather than resolution, as you'll see why in a minute. This is an eight by eight image, which gives you 64 pixels in there, okay. The second term is resolution. I'm going to use it possibly in a slightly different way than you may have heard it used. You might have heard it used to represent the pixel dimensions. I'm going to use it to refer to how many of those pixels I can squeeze into a unit length. The length that's used is inches normally. I reckon if you've got this on your screen, depending on what you're looking at it, and you've got a ruler out, you'd probably find that in one inch there was about four pixels. Four pixels per inch or PPI. The, the resolution determines the final display size of that bitmap image because you otherwise you can't tell how big the pixels are and therefore how big the image will display. So if you displayed that image on the side of a, a, a house, it would be quite big because the pixels are big. If you displayed it on your phone screen, the pixels are much smaller, you can squeeze more of them into an inch, and the, and the image will display really tiny. So this determines the physical size of the image on the display. The bit or the color depth of that image is the interesting bit, because in this case, I'm using one bit per pixel, so this is one bit per pixel, which means that I've got access to two colors. To, to tell whoever what the colors are, I also need to pass a palette through with the image as well. And the palette says, right, okay, when there's a zero in the bitmap display white, and when there's a one in the bitmap display red, and I could choose whatever colours I wish to, uh, to to display those. Now, collectively, those items are called metadata. Metadata is literally data about data. So it's da data that describes the bitmap. Okay. Other things you might get in in metadata terms if you're using your phone or a camera it might tag your location in it nothing particular to do with the image but it, it's stored in with the image as well it it will probably store the time and the date that the image was taken it will probably store the camera model that was used or the phone model that was used as well and maybe the focal length the shutter speed whatever collectively metadata is generally all right. This stuff you need, you can't do without that, or else you wouldn't be able to display the bitmap. This stuff can be removed from images. If you're worried about images on social media getting, you know, getting wind of your location, where you took them, and the date and time, and so on and so forth, 
they are, they can be stripped and you might see some uh, facilities online for for you to strip those things out of of images but collectively they're called they're called metadata right let's take a little bit of a look and it's just peeking its way at the bottom there at, at color depth or bit depth as it's called this determines it's actually a description of the number of bits per pixel that are used to store the colors the image i drew at the top there was a one bit per pixel image that gives access to two colors okay so just two colors if i use two bits per pixel two bits per pixel i get access to four colors obviously i'd need to provide the palette along with that in order to tell whoever what the colors were and what patterns represented which colors three bits per pixel is eight colors and this pattern kind of continues until you get to eight bits per pixel where that gives you access to 256 different colors that's kind of the limit to the palletized image images so in other words the indexed images so the indexed color images which you have to provide a palette with any bigger than that and the palette becomes too big you can theoretically go up to 12 bits if you wanted to the palette would be 4096 colors which would be a bit unwieldy but it's possible to do it obviously this has an implication on the file size as well because the more bits I use, the same number of pixels the more bits I use to encode each pixel the bigger the file will be this first situation because I've got 64 bits 64 pixels that will be 64 bits of storage I've got twice the number of pixels here so that will be 128 bits this one three times 196 bits and all the way up to this one which is 1024 bits for 8 bits per pixel now when you get past this point up to what we term true color which is 24 bits it doesn't really go any higher than that you can get 32 bits but the last byte on there is a transparency uh, it's called so-called alpha channel which, uh, which you know well I have talked about it, but I wasn't going to so you might see 32 bit images but they've got an extra little component in them that gives you access to 16 million 777,216 different colors I ain't going to use a palette for that I'm going to use a different system called RGB or red green blue encoding which I'll briefly talk to you about towards the end of the video interestingly the file size for that isn't a massive amount of difference even though I've used uh, quite a lot more bits per pixel uh, 1536 bits right there Ookie dookie. So, um, if you're as old as me, you'll remember who this guy is here when I put him on the screen. Here he is, Bup, uh, He Man, and um, he's, he's missing his Masters of the Universe. But this is an example of an indexed color image. So, this is a uh, you'll notice it looks fairly cartoony indexed color. It's got a palette that goes with it. Now, without the palette there, a bit like color by numbers i suppose isn't it without the palette i wouldn't know what colors to color the pixels in so it, you know I, well i couldn't even guess to be honest so there's a palette that goes along with it this particular palette color depth is a five bit 32 color palette bit of an odd color size palette size that actually uh tend to get 16 bits or or, or um sorry eight bits or uh four bits per pixel generally but not five interestingly and um it, it, the the upshot of that is because you've got quite a low color depth you tend to get the images looking looking not quite so lifelike so a little bit more sort of cartoony but it's enough um because the palette's quite small the file size is quite small it loads and downloads quite quickly off the web whatever now when we get above eight bits per pixel we start to introduce the need for this extra this extra color model so i'll very quickly talk to you about um rgb color models because i i personally think it's very important that you've seen this and that you know exactly how it works this is a close-up view of um of a computer screen and you'll notice if you look at this is just the number 18 the the pixels they're square they're they're square the pixels but if I just draw around one of them you'll see that it's made up of three coloured bars a red bar a green bar and a blue bar now this those three bars can light up they're off here if you notice and they're very bright in all the other spaces because this was actually a white background it's an additive colour model it's a bit like you might have seen didn't mean to do that in blue hope you can read it additive colour model 
a bit like you might have seen in physics when you've got the you know you shine in the uh, when you shine in the the coloured lights together and the, you mix red, green, and blue together and it makes white. You don't expect it to, but it kind of does. Okay, um, and basically what these codes tell you is the brightness of the bar. If the if the code it for the red channel is zero, then the bar's off. Off, then the bar's off. If the code for the red channel is one 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 one, which is which is decimal two five five, then the bar's on full brightness. So this tells you literally the brightness of the red channel, the brightness of the green and the brightness of the blue. And by mixing together all of those different combinations you get sixteen odd million different combinations and 16 odd million different colors so I'll give you a quick example of what this might look like in practice so if I just fill these in with with tiny teeny tiny little um, yellow I don't want to use yellow do I let's use red to fill this one in little teeny tiny binary digits 0 1 1 uh, there it is 0 uh, 0 0 0 1 that I would see as 6 1 in hexadecimal generally wouldn't work with the binary I generally work with hexadecimal because hexadecimal is easy for humans to remember binary with I'll go for the green channel next so I'll fill in I'll go 0 0 1 1 1 1 0 1 in there and that that is represented by 3D in hexadecimal. And finally, the blue channel, which is just over there, I'll go for 1, if you can see it, 1, 1, it's fairly clear, hopefully, 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and that's the same as hexadecimal A, F. Uh, that's in base 16. Remember, the reason we use hexadecimal for RGB colour codes is because there's no way I'm going to... I'd remember 613DAF quite easily. I wouldn't remember that binary string, the uh, 24-bit binary string, not a chance, uh, <coughs> which is why we use the hex. And if you look at hex colour codes, you'll see that they're generally either given in hexadecimal because it's neat and nice, or they might be given in deanery as well or base 10. So this is an RGB colour model. RGB colour model. Um, you get you don't need a palette, so no palette is necessary with this, which is a good job because it'd be one hell of a palette. Uh, you get 24 bits per pixel on these, or 32 if you've got transparency, but we're not talking about that. And it gives you access to 16,777,216 different colours. There are a couple other different ways of encoding colours in this way. You might see reference to CYMK, that stands for cyan, yellow, magenta, black, and it tends to be used for CYMK, not B, CYMK, and that, that's used for printers um, because they use dyes and, and dye colour combinations, those are the primary colours. And you might also see HSV as well, which stands for hue, saturation and value. You know, that's it, pretty good.